Those Friends of Humanity, global transnational corporations, are boycotting Facebook in order to halt the rise of hate speech. Is this a good thing for freedom of speech? Is this a good thing for social justice? Who benefits from the leverage of these powerful goliaths of the globe that exist primarily to extract profit from its population. Some of the world's most iconic brands like Adidas, Coca-Cola and more have publicly paused ad spending on the platform. Do we need these iconic brands at all really? I mean I love Coca-Cola, I love Adidas, I love stuff. I'm a consumer, I'm a product of my time, of my generation, I'm a product of the endless commercials and advertisements that have bombarded me from as long as I've had eyes and been able to decode language. But the idea that these are um, chivalrous knights committing honourable actions rather than powerful entities protecting their interests is risible. And as this culture war polemic continues and the polarization that accompanies it becomes more ossified, I begin to question where is it that we are going? Where is it that we are heading? Where is the voice of ordinary people? And indeed, can there ever be a voice for ordinary people within the mainstream? What are we choosing between here? A Facebook platform which doesn't de-platform hateful uh, incendiary speech, uh, but only as a result of the leverage of transnational corporations, who, by the way, cannot continue to extract profit from the world's population without creating exploitative conditions. If you pay what objects and items are worth, it, it, it would uh, extract the profit. You can only create profit by underpaying the workers, is it, uh, essentially, and by exploiting the earth and not behaving responsibly. Are we now to reframe transnational corporations as the great heroes in there because of the mayhem created by this peculiar cultural moment. Major brands and corporations have come out publicly to say that they're pausing their ad spends after what they say is a failure on Facebook's part to keep hate speech off its platform. It all started earlier this month when six organizations, including the NAACP and the Anti-Defamation League, started a boycott campaign for the month of July. In a sense, it's a triumph for activism because it's clearly been observed and learned that in order to elicit and force change, you have to attack corporations at the point where they are vulnerable, their advertisers. I've heard that Tucker Carlson's advertisers are pulling out as a probably as a result of pressure from activism. And if indeed you're interested in social justice and ending hate speech, then that seems like a sensible strategy. But the idea that global corporations are doing anything other than protecting their financial interests, to consider that it's anything other than that, is naive. And if they are able to do that, then by definition, the power structures remain the same other than superficial symbolic changes, i.e. don't use that type of language, cast your commercials in this type of way, uh, it possibly make some different appointments at a public level. What I'm saying is, is that if you want fundamental change, then you can't leave it to the most powerful interests in our current system that have a vested interest in conserving this very system. The movement has since gained steam. Starbucks, Coca-Cola, Adidas, Ford, Clorox. Clorox sounds like the baddie from Flash Gordon. Clorox are stepping in, thank God. Look, at what's the product there? Some sort of evil bleach and spray. It's not long ago, is it, that we would have considered Starbucks, Coca-Cola, and surely Clorox to be the very epitome of the enemies of the people. But at this point, them withdrawing their advertising from Facebook is considered a triumph. It seems to me that what is being revealed by the escalating polarity of our current international conversation is just how radical a change is required. The problem with having a figure like Trump, one of the problems of having a figure like Trump in a prominent position of power is it seems to have somehow galvanized again the centrist left to 
to think and to convey the uh, promulgate, yeah, that's the word I was looking for, the idea that it would be sufficient just to be rid of Trump, just to dial things down. If we can just dial it back to sort of Obama levels. But the reality is, is that since Clinton onwards, and probably if you did the, the his political and historical research for a lot longer than that, the centre dominating political parties in countries like the UK and the USA have simply become expressions of the interests of the powerful. Precisely these kinds of businesses, whether you're talking about Facebook or Clorox or Coca-Cola, the fluctuating power structures of Silicon Valley and manufacturers and soft drink distributors, you're still not addressing the core problem. Think for a moment, who are you? What is your life? What are you, you actually looking for? It, you're probably the same as me, that you want freedom to be who you actually are, unimpeded, not to feel that you are oppressed by either the state or the weight of a capitalist system that means that every single decision you make has to be filtered economically. Even watching this video, you will have to pay the tribute of watching an advert either on Facebook or, or on Instagram at some point when when you scroll down or on YouTube prior and possibly at the end, you know, like it's impossible for us to escape it without deconstructing the systems that frame these inst institutions. It's not enough to make symbolic changes. It's, I'm not even sure if it's particularly relevant, although it is sometimes a heartening expression of the will to change to see these apparent shifts in power, these apparent shifts in story. Like, don't listen to old Russ. Who cares about old Russ? The bloke from Forgetting Sarah Marshall and Despicable Me Too. Can I be relied upon? No. But Peter Kropotkin, one of the great fathers of anarchism, although he would probably reject a patriarchal title such as that, says, the machinery of government entrusted with the maintenance of the existing order continues to function, but every turn of its deteriorated gears, it slips and stops, its working becomes more and more difficult, and the dissatisfaction caused by its defects grows continuously. This sort of very much describes the process we're undergoing in countries like the UK, USA, and you know I don't know about elsewhere because I don't read enough. Every day gives rise to a new demand. Reform this, reform that is heard from all sides. War, finance, taxes, courts, police, Everything must be remodelled, reorganised, established on a new basis, say the reformers. And yet all know that it is impossible to make things over, to remodel anything at all because everything is interrelated. Everything would have to be remade at once. And how can society be remodelled when it is divided into two openly hostile camps? To satisfy the discontented would be only to create new malcontents. This means that our current paradigm has built into it a kind of irreversible tension that can only yield to superficial change. This is something that people have been observing for a long time. These, this book, for example, is 100 years old. So I suppose what we need to consider is what are, rather than addressing the symptoms of the problems that we're currently experiencing, how do we address the cause and where does that cause lie? Deep within the structures of the state, deep within the structures of corporations, and until we are able to change those, we're not making any kind of meaningful change at all.